everyone. Welcome back to A People's Historian, the show where we read about half an hour of history together. My name is Jason Kishineff, and we are reading Defining Moments in Black History by comedian activist Dick Gregory. Remember, if you enjoy the episode, if you like what you hear, hit that like and subscribe button and hit that notification bell so that you get notified each time I make a new video. And let's dig in. Adam Clayton Powell Jr. When Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was in Congress from 1945 to 1971, he wrote something like 98% of all the social legislation on this planet, and he inspired a lot of other lawmakers who came after him. Brilliant. God, was he brilliant. Brother Adam was... You know how there are some people you'd like to see one more time on this earth? Well, for me, one of them is Adam. I mean, he told white folks, go fuck yourself. He went to Colgate University. The average white person around him didn't know what Colgate was. They thought it was a kind of toothpaste. But he carried himself like he didn't have to apologize for anything. At the time, he was one of the greatest preachers in America, if not the greatest and there was nobody in Hollywood as handsome as he was. His colleagues were a pool of white men who wrote legislation that affected the whole world. Adam had the same position they did, but that didn't stop him from coming up against racism. Take, for instance, the story of when he went to the Congressional Dining Hall one day. A sergeant-at-arms said to him, Where are you going, Edward? Adam said, you talking to me? Yeah, N-word. Um, I'm going to eat. N-words can't eat here. Well, where do we... There's a place around 10 miles from here where all the educated, sophisticated N-words go. So how do I get there? Well, you can take a cab. The man to see, his name is Billy Simpson. So about an hour later, Adam came back to the dining hall with the most ghetto-looking black man you ever saw in your life. Scraggly beard, overalls, no shirt, barefoot. So the sergeant-at-arms came up to Adam again and said, Did you find it, boy? Then he saw the man Adam had with him and said, Who is this? Oh, Adam said, This man's name is Billy Simpson. I thought this was who you were telling me about. That the only way I could get in here was to bring this N-word with me. I guess the sergeant didn't know there was more than one Billy Simpson. And that's when all hell broke loose. Adam told the sergeant at arms, I either come in here or I'm whooping you behind and I'm throwing all the food away. That was Adam. Adam was born in Connecticut in 1908. His parents were of mixed race. The same year he was born, his father became pastor of the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, which had a congregation of 10,000 folks. So Adam grew up wealthy. He was also light-skinned enough to pass for white, which he did for a while at college. But he didn't keep that up. He came back to New York City from Colgate, got a master's degree in religious education from Columbia University and started working in his dad's church. He also became an activist on behalf of black people. When businesses wouldn't hire black folks, Adam organized pickets and marches. He set up soup kitchens and other services for people in the community. And to draw attention to it all, he founded a newspaper, The People's Voice. That helped him win a seat on the New York City Council in 1941. He ran for Congress in 1944, calling for civil rights and an end to job discrimination against blacks. For the first 10 years, he was one of only two blacks in all of Congress. He butted heads with racist Southern Democrats. He was outspoken. He made himself heard. He advised presidents to support African countries struggling to win independence, and he was relentless with his civil rights work. 
1954, the Supreme Court decided in the matter of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, that segregated schools were unconstitutional. But that didn't mean school districts were in a rush to desegregate. Adam knew that. He wrote what's called a rider, saying that schools in the South couldn't get federal funds until they fell in line with desegregation, and he attached that rider to a bunch of bills in Congress. That later became part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Title VI of the Act says there can't be race discrimination in programs that get federal money. We owe that to Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., that's the kind of thing that outraged other congressmen. They were out to get Adam. I don't want to say he was perfect, but neither were his, were his colleagues. And they punished him for doing exactly what they were doing because he was black and proud and didn't apologize for it. They nailed him for taking trips at public expense and missing committee meetings, taking away his committee chairmanship and finally kicking him out of Congress altogether. Then he won a special election to fill his own vacant seat. He served until 1970 when Charles Rangel beat him in the election. When his enemies in Congress were coming after him, Adams said, I wish to state very emphatically that I will always do just what every other congressman and committee chairman has done and is doing and will do. That was Adams. Tough, bad, black man till the end. The murder of Emmett Till. Now they say Rosa Parks was the spark of the civil rights movement, but I'll tell you who sparked Rosa Parks. Emmett Till's mama, Mammy. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old black boy from Chicago who went to see some relatives in a little town in Mississippi in 1955. The name of that town was Money. Money? Now isn't that something? Yeah. It's as if folks wanted to name the town after the thing they cared about the most, but they couldn't call the town Killing Negroes, so they had to settle for the next best thing. One day Emmett was in a store in the town and they said that he looked at and whistled at a 21-year-old white woman. Or so they said. They called it reckless eyeballing. Boy, what did he do that for? A couple of days later, the woman's husband and the husband's half-brother went to where Emmett was staying and kidnapped him. What they did to that poor boy? It'd be quicker to tell you what they didn't do. When they ran out of ways to torture him, they shot him and threw his body in the Tallahatchie River. After Emmett's body was pulled from the river and sent back to Chicago for the funeral, that was when Mammy gave the world the shock it needed. She insisted on having an open casket funeral service so the world could see what those men had done to her boy. The men got away with it and then later admitted they'd done it. So many thousands of people attended the funeral and saw Emmett's body. A whole bunch fainted, and a whole bunch more needed smelling salts. And with good reason. Ever seen a monster movie or a zombie movie? I'm telling you, the Oscar winningest makeup man in Hollywood couldn't make somebody look like that boy looked in his casket. Then John H. Johnson published photos of Emmett's face in Jet Magazine. And then everybody saw it including Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. One day I was talking to Rosa Parks. I said to her, just teasing her, when you refused to give up your seat on that bus, you wasn't just tired like white folks said you was. She started crying, and I couldn't believe the answer she gave me. Martin Luther King Jr., who gets all the credit for everything, was just an earnest Baptist preacher. His consciousness came from the white schools he went to, and he had that twang that Baptist preachers have that white folks can't understand. 
That's why all we ever heard of him on the TV networks was sound bites. Go on to the mountaintop and the rest of that stuff you hear year in and year out on his birthday. But think about Rosa Parks and the effect she had on the whole planet. She didn't have a church behind her like King did, but look what she did. When she refused to give up her bus seat to a white dude and got arrested for it, black and white folks rallied around her. That day I spoke to her. We were just kicking back, having dinner at a hotel. I was only playing when I said, look at your pretty feet. And they wanted to say you wouldn't give up your seat because you were tired. Think about it. White folks try to say that if Rosa hadn't been too tired to get up from her seat that day, none of it would ever have happened. Everything that sparked the civil rights movement, that's what we let historians get away with. And incidentally, that's how I learned the story. I said to her, tell me, you tell me what happened. And when she did, she caught me by surprise. She sounded almost like she was in a trance. I just couldn't get Emmett Till off my mind, she said. Rosa was born in 1913 in Tuskegee, Alabama. Her daddy was one angry man because he wanted to be a Garveyite. Garveyites were those black folks who followed Marcus Garvey, a Jamaican-born black nationalist who advocated Pan-Africanism and the economic and political empowerment of blacks. But Marcus Garvey didn't accept light-skinned Negroes, and Rosa's dad was one. So instead, he had to make do with sitting on his porch with his double-barrel shotgun, daring white folks to mess with him. At the time of the bus incident, Rosa was a secretary for the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. White folks like to say she was just some tired housewife who didn't want to stand up on the bus that day, but she was no less an activist than Martin Luther King Jr. In Montgomery, Alabama, where it happened, Negroes had to sit at the back of the bus behind the white folks. But here's one thing I didn't know. They had to get on the bus at the front door, pay their fare, and then get back off the bus and walk to the back door. When black folks got on at the back, they might find white boys in the back flirting with the black sisters. And most of those women would be flirting back, smiling and saying, Oh, come on, Ed, you don't mean it. But not Rosa Parks. She didn't play that mess. When white boys tried flirting with her, she'd say, Don't you ever say that to me again, you son of a bitch, you. Also, if you were black and you were sitting in the last row of seats reserved for white folks and a white person wanted to sit down in that row in your seat, then the three other black folks in the same row had to get up too. It wasn't just one seat involved. That was segregation for you. Anyway, a couple of times when Rosa got off the bus to walk to the back door after paying her fare up front, the driver drove off and left her. One driver in particular. When she was describing that famous day to me, Rosa said, had I known that was him, meaning the driver who had given her trouble before, I wouldn't have got on that bus. But that's the universe at work. <clears throat> so there's Rosa sitting in the first row of the colored section when a white guy gets on, and there are no free seats in the white section. Later this man would say, we were getting off in a couple of stops. So he wasn't the one trying to make Rosa Parks give up her seat. He figured it wasn't worth the trouble. But the bus driver, the same one Rosa wanted to avoid, went back there and called her an N-word bitch and told her to get up. But Rosa wasn't having it. She wasn't just tired. She was mad as hell because she was thinking about Emmett Till. The Montgomery Bus Boycott. Today you've got cops killing black folks over nothing just because they're black. Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, 
too many to name. Our black children, our black husbands, every now and then a black woman. And some black activists are trying to do something, but a lot of black people don't care because they're scared. There's a way to fight back, though, if we would just organize and think about one word. Retail. One third of all retail sales happen between Thanksgiving and Christmas. In other words, in one month, businesses make a third of all the money they make all year. Now, unless your daddy's a businessman, you probably didn't know that, but now you know. So if we all said, because of these black men being killed, we're calling for a boycott from Thanksgiving through Christmas, if we did that, we would be heard. We've taken this kind of action in the past. What am I talking about? Down south in the 1950s, the bus boycotts. It started in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. Everybody knows Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus in Montgomery and that that sparked the bus boycotts. But what some people forget is this. The reason the boycotts worked was because the buses were a business. And when they couldn't get black folks money, they were brought to their knees. We black folks got sick of paying our money for the privilege of being abused by all white drivers and being told where we could and couldn't sit. Martin Luther King Jr. organized the boycott, hoping that 60% of black people would participate. Instead, 90 to 100% of us did, because we'd had enough. Black folks got together and said, no more, and it worked. The bus company gave in to our demands. Then the boycott spread to other cities. That's what we need to do today. The Montgomery bus boycott went on for 381 days, over a year. But I'm only talking about boycotting businesses for one month. We've got to decide what we want. Do we want to protect our sons and daughters and husbands and wives and mothers? Or do we want to spend money we don't even have on stupid toys and then tell our kids they came from a white man named Santa Claus? Do we want our kids to grow up safe? Or do we want to freeze our behinds off waiting for stores to open on Black Friday and then trample one another to death trying to get a pair of sneakers in the spirit of Christmas? <laughs> we all know it would be easier on us all around to just not shop. Because we know that we don't have the money, we can say that it's for a good reason, protesting police brutality. Pullman Porters and the Montgomery Improvement Association. I want to tell you a story about cooperation. It starts back in the 19th century. George Pullman was one smart white guy. In the mid-1860s, just about the time slavery ended, he designed his own line of railroad sleeping cars. Pullman cars. That's not what proved he was smart. Any fool could have come up with that. Although any fool didn't. What made George Pullman smart was that he realized he needed folks to work on those cars. And because he was in business, he didn't want to pay those workers more than he had to. So now you're looking to hire porters for the sleeping cars, and you want them cheap. And slavery has just breathed its last sorry-ass breath. So what do you do? Hire black folks. Yes, that George Pullman was one smart white dude. Well, anyway, you have to admit his timing was good. He really was smart, though, for this reason. In the 19th century, all rich folks were white, but not all white folks were rich. Matter of fact, a lot of them were struggling to get by. Some of them not doing much better than some black folks. The only, play, the only way those white folks had servants was in their dreams. George Pullman figured it this way. As long as white folks were sleeping in his cars, he'd give them their dreams. If they took an overnight train trip, they could sleep in a Pullman car and pretend for as long as they were on it that they were Massa himself, 
with a big old six foot three pearly white teeth grinning negro waiting on them hand and foot. Now this wasn't exactly a bargain for the porters, at least it wasn't supposed to be, but show me a negro and I'll show you somebody who knows how to turn a messed up situation to his own advantage. By the time the porters finished paying for their own uniforms and for the polish that went on white folks shoes, they may not have had two dimes to rub together from their own salaries. Still they got paid in something else. Information from folks who forgot those six foot three inch bl pitch black silent grinning men had ears and brains. Hell they forgot they were there at all. Those Negroes may as well have been invisible. The white folks got to talking about how the stock market was going to be fixed and other tidbits about Wall Street and the porters took that information and what little money they had and they made a killing. That's why so many of the Pullman porters died millionaires and so many of their children finished college. Thurgood Marshall, dad was a Pullman porter. Meanwhile, if you were a porter and you recommended your son or nephew, he could be one too. One leaves, another comes in. It was the closest thing black folks had to an inheritance, and it kept on into the 20th century. Now watch this here. The porters had a problem because when they came south, they couldn't stay in hotels, couldn't go to restaurants, good old Jim Crow in action. So black folks down south would put them up. Meanwhile, after Rosa Parks did what she did, E.D. Nixon and other folks in Montgomery formed the Montgomery Improvement Association to boycott the bus system. When word of the boycott got out, folks from around the world sent money to the association to support it. But white bankers wouldn't open an account for the association to put the money in. Now you might say, what kind of banker doesn't want money in his bank? That's how much white supremacists hated black folks. So the association gave the money to Pullman Porters to deposit the bank up to deposit in a bank up north. That's how those millions of dollars got into the movement. That's what we can do when we work together. Cooperation, man. It's a great story, isn't it? The Little Rock Nine. Melba Patillo Beals, Minnie Jean Brown, Elizabeth Eckford, Ernest Green, Gloria Ray Karlmark, Carlotta Walls Lanier, Thelma Mothershed, Terrence Roberts, Jefferson Thomas. These nine were a lot like Jackie Robinson when he integrated Major League Baseball. Excuse me. Just like Jackie, they were sent into a place where they would be the only black people. Just like Jackie, they were chosen because they were good at what they did. And just like Jackie, they were told they couldn't fight back if anybody gave them trouble. Difference was, Jackie was a grown man when he did what he did. And the nine I've just named were all in their teens in 1857. 1957. The year they integrated Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas. They were kids. That was a lot to put on some kids, even if they were brave. And they were. <clears throat> if they were brave, other folks were acting like fools or worse. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court had ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. But after that, it wasn't like the all-white schools were in a race to see who could integrate first. It took the NAACP to get in people's faces and demand desegregation. That was how the school board in Little Rock came up with its plan to integrate Central High first and then move on to some junior high schools. It chose the nine black students because they had good grades and good attendance records. The nine showed up at the school on September 4th, and all hell broke loose. The governor of Arkansas was Orville Faubus. 
Now you would have thought those nine students were the loved children of Godzilla and King Kong, the way Fabus reacted to them. He didn't just say he didn't want them in the school. He called out the Arkansas National Guard to make sure they didn't get in. Not that he needed to. The day the nine tried to enter the school, racist whites lined the streets holding signs, yelling all kinds of hateful stuff, and even spitting in those poor kids' faces. Those nine kids weren't monsters, but for that mob they represented something just as scary. The idea that black kids were just as good as their kids. That blacks were people just like them. A world without somebody to look down on was just too horrible for those white folks to think about. Well, what happened in Little Rock made news all over the country. Dwight Eisenhower, Ike, was president at the time. <clears throat> and when the whole nation saw what was going on down there, he was forced to act. He federalized the Arkansas National Guard, meaning that instead of doing what Fabas told them to do, they had to do what Ike said. So now, instead of blocking the students from going into the school, the guard had to protect them from the angry mob. Then Ike went one better than that and sent in the 101st Airborne Division of the U.S. Army, minus its black soldiers. Ike must have figured that if the whites in Little Rock saw a bunch of uniformed black folks coming at them, there would be another civil war. After 20 days, the nine students were finally able to attend school. But it wasn't as if their problems were over. White students harassed them like it was their job, and most of the time the National Guard who had been sent inside the school to protect the nine students didn't do a thing. At an age when kids should be thinking about who's going to be their prom date and what colleges they might apply to, those nine students had to wake up every morning knowing they had to attend a school full of folks who hated them. Just like Jackie Robinson, the Little Rock Nine made a sacrifice for others. Those kids served their country as much as any soldier. That's why in 1999, President Bill Clinton gave each of them the Congressional Gold Medal. We have fought a great deal for education. I find it astounding that young people randomly drop out of school these days because the teacher doesn't like me or other nonsense. Trust me, freedom is found in education. <coughs> Desegregating lunch counters. Desegregating lunch counters in 1960, that was done by young people too, but they weren't from the NAACP even though the NAACP was putting up the bail when those young people got arrested. No, these were youngsters going in there on their own. College students who had been inspired by Martin Luther King Jr.'s nonviolent protests. They didn't just decide one day to go into those establishments and sit down. They first had to learn how to do it. Activists like James Lawson trained them, teaching them how to sit still at the counters while white folks cussed at them, called them names, or worse, hit them, threw raw eggs at them. Believe me, that stuff is not easy. Our instinct would be to fight, or maybe to run, but to just sit there? That took some serious discipline, not to mention guts. Those young people knew they could die. One thing, as an American, you've been taught to fight back. So how long does it take to train a person so he goes from not taking stuff from anybody to saying, I got to take some stuff off white folks, but I'm not going to hit them back. So when the activists went to the Woolworth lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and sat there, they knew what to expect. There were four of them at first, Ezell Blair Jr., Franklin McCain, Joseph McNeil and David Richmond, all students at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Soon they would be called the Greensboro Four. 
The first day, the four of them sat at the counter and asked politely for coffee. The servers said no, and the manager asked them to leave, but the four stayed until the place closed that night. The next day they went back, and 20 other black students from different schools joined them. By that time, there were newspaper reporters and a TV camera present. Third day, 60 people. Fourth day, more than 300. A few days after that, the lunch counter protest spread to other southern cities like Richmond, Virginia, excuse me, Richmond, Virginia, and Nashville, Tennessee. Meanwhile, people boycotted other stores in Greensboro with segregated lunch counters and it cut into the store's profits so bad that the managers said to hell with it and desegregated the lunch counters. The same approach worked when it came to black, fo black folks traveling on integrated buses. They'd get on the buses, racist whites would stop the buses, and the Ku Klux Klan would be waiting to whoop them. Up, whoop them. And those brave, disciplined young people just took it. Then all at once the stories started hitting the papers, and readers were embarrassed to see the people beating on folks who weren't fighting back. That's how people's minds and the laws get changed through young black people's bravery and messing with folks' money a bit. Dorothy Height and the National Council of Negro Women. Dorothy Height was president of the National Council of Negro Women she was born in Virginia in 1912. When she was young, her family moved to Pennsylvania and she went to integrated schools. She was so good at speaking that she won a national competition in high school that got her a college scholarship. She was on her way. Barnard College in New York City accepted her and then changed its mind. It took only two black students a year and apparently it already had its two. Height didn't let this discourage her though. She enrolled at New York University and got her bachelor's and master's degree there. At 25, she joined the National Council of Negro Women, which was started in 1935 by Mary McLeod Bethune, who figured that there were so many organizations for black women around the country that they needed a to talk to one another a little bit. That's what the council was for. Bethune was the first woman to run it, and then she handed it off to Dorothy Faraby. Next after that was Vivian Carter Mason, and then in 1957, just when things were heating up good with the Civil Rights Movement and all the folks opposed to it, Dorothy Height took over the organization. She couldn't have picked a tougher or more exciting time to do it. When we black folks started demanding our rights in the South, things turned violent. Blacks and white folks got beaten, arrested, killed. Height took a peaceful approach to the whole thing. She arranged for what she called Wednesdays in Mississippi. Groups of women of different races went around together in the summer of 1964 to try to improve how blacks and whites related to one another and to help with voter registration. Now, if it wasn't bad enough that she had to watch black people get mistreated, she also had her own people mistreating her. Even though she was in charge of a major civil rights organization, and even though she helped organize the 1963 March on Washington, black men didn't ask her to speak at it. She was standing right there near Martin Luther King Jr. when he was giving his I Have a Dream speech, and she didn't get to say a word. One civil rights leader, James Farmer, even admitted it. He later called Height one of the big six in the civil rights movement along with King, Farmer, John Lewis, Roy Wilkins, and Whitney Young, but said she didn't get credit because she was a woman. 
Sure enough, a lot of people put A. Philip Randolph in the Big Six instead of Height. And don't think she wasn't aware of it herself. She said the men in the group were happy to include women in the human family, but there was no question as to who headed the household. Whatever list she was on or wasn't on, Height made herself and her organization heard. She advised President Dwight Eisenhower to integrate schools and leaned on President Lyndon Johnson to place black women in positions in government. Height was president of the National Council of Negro Women for 40 years. Another U.S. president, Bill Clinton, gave her the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1994 and in 2004, she was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. She died in 2010 at 98 years old. When he gave her eulogy, President Obama called her the godmother of civil rights. Selma. The march in Selma Alabama in 1965 wasn't about voting rights, as many historians would have you believe. It was about a civil rights worker named Jimmy Lee Jackson. This church deacon, 26 years old, went to vote and they wouldn't let him. It was about Jimmy Lee and being a turtle. Let me explain. Remember one thing. 66 million years ago, that big horrible thing, the asteroid bigger than mountains, killed the dinosaurs. <clears throat> That's the information they feed to you, your children, and your grandchildren. What they don't tell you is when the dinosaur was here, so was the turtle, and so was the butterfly. That was 66 million years ago, and the turtle and butterfly are still here? Gorgeous, pretty not evil or mean or horrible the turtle just makes his way along real slow and that's how we won the civil rights movement we took on the mightiest nation in the history of the planet with no guns and we did it by becoming turtles hard on the outside soft on the inside and willing to stick our necks out we need to recognize that as a strength in February 1965, Jimmy Lee Jackson was part of a march in Marion, Alabama. The marchers were protesting the arrest of another worker, James Orange. Now this was a peaceful protest, but the Alabama state troopers didn't care about peaceful. All they heard was protest, and they thought it was time to bust heads. And worse, the night of the protest, they turned off all the street lights in the town. And when it was good and dark, the troopers went at those folks with clubs. But not just clubs. The protesters took off running. Jimmy Lee and some others wound up in a restaurant, Max Cafe. That's Mac apostrophe S. Max Cafe. Jimmy Lee's mother and granddaddy were there too. And the troopers started beating all of them. When they began beating Jimmy, Lee, Jimmy Lee's granddaddy, his mother went to pull them off and they started whipping her. They shot Jimmy Lee in the belly five times and then carried him off to jail to book him. Didn't take him to a hospital till the next day. A few days later he died. That's what the march in Selma was about. It wasn't about voting rights, it was about Jimmy Lee Jackson. And when that march happened, that's when all hell broke loose. You go by Jimmy Lee Jackson's grave back then, and you're sitting there with rifles shooting the tomb. Excuse me. And they're sitting there with rifles shooting the tombstone. For those who haven't been to jail but kind of wonder in the back of their minds what it was like in the civil rights days, well, let me explain it to you. First day you get arrested, the food is horrible. Second day, it's miserable. The third day, it doesn't taste too bad. The fourth day, you're asking for the recipe. By the time I got down, 
south to protest, blood was running in the streets. I left the hotel one night to get a case of whiskey because I drank with this one state trooper every night. This trooper was a brother, married to a black woman, lived in a black neighborhood. His children went to black schools, but the white folks thought he was white. So he came to see me with this look on his face. I said, what's happening, man? Where's the whiskey? He said, I was at this meeting, man, and tomorrow they've got 300 white folks who came in from all over the South. They're going to kill all of y'all. And our job is to rope off the press so they can't get across the street. I'm just thankful I know you, man, so you can tell the folks. I guess he thought if I told the marchers about the danger, we'd all stay home. I said, I'm not going to tell them nothing. I came here to die. I don't want to die. I came here to die. So tomorrow we die. The next day we were there. The next day we were there and the trooper who had warned me and who was on duty now and passing for white looked at me with tears in his eyes, shaking his head, and whispered, You didn't tell them. We were there, old black folks, young black folks, singing, Glory, glory, hallelujah, mine eyes have seen the glory. We were marching. Then, at a certain point, we got to one corner, and, just like my trooper friend had told me, the troopers had roped off the press. Then I looked in another direction and saw a whole lot of angry white folks waiting on us. I thought about my wife and my children, but this was war. I saw that the white mob had pickaxes, rifles, clubs. I thought, I sure don't want to die. If I'd known this was going to happen, I'd have got me a little pussy before I left home. Then the marchers saw all the armed white folks, but we kept singing and we kept praying. Most of us didn't know what was fixing to happen. Then all of a sudden I saw those white folks shaking. They were scared. A look had come over their faces. It was like I had died and gone to another planet. I looked at them and they dropped their pickaxes. They had this horrible look on their faces. And two years later, I figured, figured out what it was. We marchers were out there, unafraid, willing to die but not to kill. And well, those folks saw the Spirit of God in us. We kept marching, and we kept marching. Thanks for joining me. Tune into the next episode, and in the meantime, hit that like and subscribe button, will ya? Hit that notification bell, because... YouTube has been known to unsubscribe people. See you next time.